Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you for attending the second day of our annual workshop on survey methodology. I am Alexandre Barbosa from the Regional Center for Studies on the Development of the Information Society, CETIC.br, at the Brazilian Network Information Center. Uh, this event is jointly organized by CETIC.br and the National School of Statistical Science linked to the Brazilian Institute for Geography and Statistics, IBG, our national statistical office. For those who were not able to join us yesterday, I just want to mention that we had two very interesting sessions on data collection, innovation, and dissemination for estimation of ICT indicators and price indices. And in fact, we yesterday already touched the surface of today's topics of big data, but today we are going to deep dive on big data in official statistics, we will discuss new methods based on alternative data sources and how to meet quality standards. Uh, we also discuss the use of machine learning as statistical methods, among other topics in the domain of official statistics. So um, without any further ado, I would like to invite Professor Pedro Nascimento Silva from the National Statistical uh, School of Statistical Science who will introduce our guest speakers and moderate today's uh, webinar. I wish all of you a very interactive and productive webinar. And thank you very much, Professor Pedro, for having accepted our invitation to moderate uh, today's webinar. It is really a, a great pleasure to, to have you here with us today. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandre. Um, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, moderating your session today. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I again welcome you to this second day of our uh, uh, Nick BR um, workshop on survey methodology, which is in its 11th edition. Uh, due to the pandemic, we had to conduct this year's webinar once again entirely online through a series of webinars addressing the theme of innovation and trends on ICT data production. We are looking forward that in 2022, we will be able to return to the traditional face-to-face -face format and welcome all of you in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We all know that uh, the COVID pandemic has severely affected the data collection activities, impacting production of public and official statistics around the globe. All national statistical offices and similar data producers face challenges to maintain their outputs through traditional methods. Face-to-face -face data collection became very difficult, if not impossible, in many parts of the world. Hence, innovation, cooperation, adaptability were key to enable them to continue producing reliable data and information to meet users' needs. The pandemic crisis has also highlighted the vital role digital technologies play in connecting people and allowing institutions to enable their continuity of labor, education, public services, commerce, etc. This 11th edition of the NIC.BR workshop on survey methodology uh, will showcase and discuss innovative methodologies and explore new data sources to address complex issues in the domain of ICT data production uh, to bridge data gaps. The disruption on data production caused by the COVID-19 crisis certainly presented challenges, but also created new opportunities. Some trends on the production of statistics will be addressed by speakers in today's session. Before we start our session, I'd like to remind us of the rules for online interaction in this virtual workshop. The format of today's webinar is composed by two sessions with keynote presentations of 50 minutes plus Q&A sessions of about 15 minutes each. After the first keynote presentation, we will have a 15 minute uh, comfort break um, after the, the Q&A session for the first keynote presentation. 
Please note that simultaneous translation is available for Portuguese um, and Spanish and English. Please select the preferred language in the globe icon. Please check that your microphone is always muted uh, once the workshop starts. Uh, and we ask you kindly to use the chat area for raising questions or comments to the speakers. I will read them and pass them on to the speakers. Uh, if we have time, I may have, be able to open the floor for some of you to present uh, your questions uh, um, orally. Please note that the meeting will be recorded for report writing purposes. And if you stay on the meeting, you are implicitly agreeing to um, this recording. Now we will start our second webinar entitled Big Data and Official Statistics. I'd like to give the floor to Marco Putz, who is a methodologist and data scientist at Statistics Netherlands. His research focuses on the usability of big data and machine learning in official statistics. Marco, you have 15 minutes, and if needed, I will interrupt you about five minutes before your time is up. So please, Marco, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, now I have to share my screen. Ah, there we go. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so um, the session uh, of today is called Big Data and Official Statistics. And uh, the main part of this, uh, this talk will be on using machine learning uh, algorithms uh, uh, as statistical methods. And uh, a lot of people working in data science uh, think that using machine learning is quite straightforward. But uh, as always, we methodologists always uh, uh, think uh, differently. <laughs> and uh, the way I found out uh, this is different from, uh, from uh, just using the methods uh, I will present here. Mm -hmm. So official statistics have a, a very uh, clear uh, quality framework. And um, besides all the, 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 the time-related um, uh, dimensions of, uh, of quality of official statistics, I show you here uh, the, the, the most important, actually, all of them, uh, the, the, the dimensions which, which statistics have to be uh, fulfilled before you can call it an official statistics. It has to be relevant, it has to be accurate, we don't like bias in our statistics, it has to be accessible, it has to be clear, it has to be coherent, and it has to be comparable. And uh, at the moment that you have statistics which, uh, which have to fulfill these uh, these quality standards, uh, it's actually an obvious that the methods itself that you use also need to, uh, to meet these quality uh, standards. And, and somehow uh, we have to, to, to deal with that. So we have to make sure that these me methods uh, are at that point. And most of the methods that we used earlier um, uh, actually were quite straightforward uh, when it was about uh, making decisions and stuff like that, and it, it was quite easy to to to, to get them uh, to these quality standards. But now we are using machine learning, and with machine learning, it is quite hard. One of the things that happens, for instance, is that when you uh, use a machine learning algorithm, most of the people actually don't know anymore which assumptions are underlying the the, the methods. I mean. Uh, for a statistical methodologist, uh, it's it's re really uh, um, yeah really bad if you have a method uh, and you are going to use it without uh, knowing uh, which uh, which uh, assumptions you. But in machine learning, it's quite normal to to have this, and somehow we have to deal with this. We have to deal with the fact that we have these methods and that you can apply them, and somehow the model should be relevant, accurate, uh, accessible, cl clear, coherent, and comparable. So, so how do we do that? Um, I will um, will tell this uh, with in, in the following steps. First, I will say something about uh, the, uh, the research method uh, most uh, most uh, data scientists use, which is uh, actually induction. Uh, then I will uh, uh, forward to machine learning itself. Then I will come to uh, uh, classification. I will zoom in on classification. Then. I won't repeat the title of this uh, this part. Uh, it's a long one, and uh, um, it will be clear at the moment that I start talking about it. It has to do with the fact that when you have human annotated data, it's actually um, uh, restricting the performance of your uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, then I will say something about representativity of training sets, and I will finish with uh, explainable AI. 
But first, induction and deduction. And I also added there abduction. Um, I come from the field of uh, visual sciences. Um, and uh, within visual sciences, it is uh, really normal that uh, researchers start with, uh, uh, with uh, wondering about something. And the thing I wanted to illustrate here is uh, uh, they wonder uh, about this cafe wall, uh, which is somewhere in the United Kingdom. And uh, because it looks like the, 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 the tiles are not straight, are not in a straight line. They are actually banded. And uh, whereas when you take uh, a ruler, then you will see that actually all the lines are straight. So uh, th th this is the starting point of research within the visual sciences. It's, it's just an observation. And uh, all, a, a lot of research starts like this. Uh, for instance, here, the muller lyer illusion uh, is something like this. Uh, this line has the same length as this line. Uh, then the squint lighting gr grid illusion, you see black, uh, black dots appear in the middle of the Y dot uh, when, you, when, you, uh, uh, when you look around. Uh, the cafe wall illusion I also uh, explained, uh, but the, uh, the the nicest one are uh, paintings of uh, M.C. Asher, which are actually actually impossible. Uh, uh, when you follow the water, then it uh, enters here, it goes uh, here and here and here, it streams down, and then at a certain moment, you are at the top of the building again. Uh, so somehow we look at local, uh, local uh, cues and not at the complete uh, picture so uh, uh, and that's why we don't see this this strange uh, effect we don't see that strange effect so so somehow and this also leads to a lot of research about uh, local uh, local and global perception so what you do uh, in in those fields is that you start uh, inductive you start with an uh, observation and you try to recognize some patterns in that uh, observation, uh, you form a possible hypothesis and you form a theory. And in my opinion, you shouldn't end there. Uh, at the moment that you enter, inductive research is really uh, like a lot of um, methodologies say, say uh, not good. So uh, actually, I know machine learners who actually stop uh, up here. They have uh, uh, their observation and something they come with a pattern and they stop with uh, everything and say, okay, I have a model, but, but uh, at least you, you have to form a theory and, and a data scientist forms a theory. But then it comes, then you have to generalize from that theory and you have to form a new hypothesis uh, due to, uh, uh, in the next uh, deductive step, you have uh, to, to, to gather new observations, maybe more data, maybe look in a different way to the data, and you have to come to an interpretation. And, and this one loops around as long as uh, as uh, as it is uh, necessary within uh, and, um, uh, philosophy, um, uh, this is called scientific realism. So uh, you know that there is somewhere a ground truth out there, but you don't know what the ground truth is exactly. And the more you investigate on the ground truth, the closer you get to the ground truth. And that is actually how you should do uh, research uh, in data science, in my opinion. So inductive research is not bad, not bad at all, but you should uh, go further than that and uh, come in that uh, deductive cycle at a certain moment and make sure that you uh, deepen your, uh, your, uh, your knowledge about uh, what you're investigating. So the next, part, the next slide is on uh, machine learning. And machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence started uh, as a field uh, where people tried to mimic human intelligence um, and uh, uh, they were not really successful in that. But some of the things that they developed within artificial intelligence are quite, quite successful. And one of uh, the areas is machine learning. Um, roughly, uh, we, uh, we see in machine learning, uh, we can uh, see in machine learning, unsupervised learning and supervised learning. Um, uh, unsupervised learning uh, are clustering techniques, for instance, uh, and supervised you can have classification and regression. And I will focus here on classification because we see that within big data, when uh, we are looking at uh, texts, uh, when we are looking at images, we are always trying to classify the to classify the text and the images. We don't do that much regression. It's most mostly classification that we do uh, in the field of big data. So I will focus on uh, classification uh, in this presentation. Uh, 
Now let me explain classification. I mean, you all know uh, logistic regression. I don't have to explain that, but but just see if we can uh, can get a grip of uh, of uh, classific classification. For me, classification is the following problem. I have a um, somehow I have a, a set of features on uh, something, and I have a function that maps those features onto a score. And on the x-axis here, I plotted the score, and on the y-axis, I plotted the proportion of uh, of uh, of uh, of times the, the the number of times that such a score appears uh, uh, in the data set. So uh, so I have a set of features. Uh, I have a function which maps the the, the set of features uh, the, the the features on uh, on uh, on the number which is a score, and I plot the score against the features. I have two categories in this uh, this case. The negatives and the positives. Let's call the, the red, the, the red, the negatives, and the green the positives. And um, uh, what, the, the the goal is to find somehow some some score which separates the positives uh, from the negatives, and that's what you see here. Uh, many of the the, the schoolbook uh, examples of machine learning, um, you always see that these two are completely separated. So the, 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 the negatives and the positives are completely separated. And uh, actually, I found a lot of data sets on the web, uh, and they said that they were for educational purposes, but I didn't learn anything from them because the first model that I always use, and that's just logistic regression, when I apply it to, <laughs> uh, to these uh, data sets, I got a perfect uh, um, 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 uh, segregation of the negatives and the positives. So, so it's actually... I hope uh, when you are studying machine learning in modern times that you will have some more challenging uh, data sets because they are really not challenging. So, but what you see in reality is something like this. Um, when you are uh, classifying texts, uh, like Pete Das will uh, show in the next presentation, when you are classifying images, uh, you will find a score which looks like this, where the, there is a large overlap between the negatives and the positives. And somehow you have to decide where you uh, choose that something is positive and negative. And you can do, do, do that with uh, introducing a threshold. For instance, the most uh, um, optimal uh, threshold in this case is the one which is at the intersection of the two distributions. So you can actually prove that. And as uh, someone who worked in visual sciences uh, in psychophysics, I actually proved it a lot of times uh, when I was giving lectures. So uh, so that's uh, that's uh, one, one place where you can uh, leave it. But if you really have to be sure that all the negatives are in your data set are, are classified in the right way, then you actually um, have to move the uh, the threshold up, and this is what uh, machine learners call high precision and low recall. So uh, um, this is one uh, possibility. And the other possibility is that you want to make sure that all the the negative, all the positives are in your data set. That is when you move the threshold really down. So uh, so this is uh, the way uh, we are looking at uh, at these. Uh, these algorithms so um, but sometimes problems appear and uh, these problems have to do with bias like uh, the title already says and uh, for that i have a thought experiment so suppose i have 99 uh, red uh, marbles and one green marble and i want to uh, have a model that predicts the color correctly in 99 percent of the cases so i'm blindfolded i take out one uh, one uh, model and I have to say in 99% of the cases uh, correctly, which marble it is. And um, maybe it is uh, nice to let people over the chat uh, um, uh, give us the, 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 the model which actually does this. So uh, it's actually not, uh, not really a difficult question, but, uh, but I, yeah. And I cannot see the chat, so uh, um, I hope Pedro is going to help me. <laughs> For now, we still don't have anybody replying, but mm -hmm. somebody now said all red. Yeah, that's actually the right model. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you take uh, the model where all, when you always say that the marbles are red, then everything works. Works. But suppose I throw in ninety-eight uh, green marbles extra, then the model actually doesn't work anymore. Then uh, actually the 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 
there are 50% uh, red marbles and 50% uh, green marbles. And the model, which uh, was working really well uh, at a certain moment, uh, doesn't work anymore. So somehow uh, the predictive power of the model uh, just disappeared. Um, I always like to look at uh, classification algorithms uh, um, using a, a Bayesian ideal observer model. It's something that also comes from perception. It's uh, com coming from uh, psychophysics and uh, is also adopted by, uh, adopted by, uh, by decision theory. And uh, what it says here is that uh, the pro uh, probability of a certain class given a feature vector is equal to the, the probability of the feature vector given a class that's the probability of the class, this is a prior, uh, divided by the probability of the feature vector. And um, uh, in our case, we didn't have any information about features because I was blindfolded. So this is actually a uniform distribution. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the predictive power of the model is completely dependent on the proportion uh, positives and the proportion uh, green marbles uh in uh in in the in the jar so uh it's completely dependent on this one the fact that i know how many red and how many green marbles are in the in the in the in the jar uh, makes that the model works uh, it doesn't have to do anything with this part which is actually the the intelligent part of the of the model so uh somehow uh we we, we have to deal with that uh, especially when you're making Official statistics. This is this can be your target variable. The proportion positives in your your population, the the proportion people having COVID in your population, the the, the proportion uh, men and women in uh, in your population, uh, the proportion innovative com companies in your population. This is actually your your interesting uh, variable, and uh, it's 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 here in the prior. So uh, so how can these models ever work? So uh, that, that, that's that's my that's the question that I started to ask myself uh, last year, and I came to a conclusion. Uh, people at Statistics Now didn't hear from me for a couple of months, and uh, I finally came to the conclusion, and it has to do with uh, with uh, the, the 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 px here. So the probability of the uh, the probability distribution of the features, um, and uh, what I can do is actually uh, define uh, this probability uh, like this, um, and uh, what I can do is just by uh, by uh, just creating a maximum likelihood estimator of the probability of positives uh, in there, and, and then I can actually do something good about it. I think that the Bay Bayesian ideal observer model is actually a very good model to model a lot of things. So I use it now to to model bias, uh, but uh, I also I'm, I'm also looking. Uh, at um, at, um, uh, at at other uh, things that uh, can happen with that data, uh, with the, those models, to, to put it in this model. Uh, it looks very much like a naive base method uh, for the machine learners are, uh, with us, but the thing is that I, uh, I'm i not using it to uh, predict the model itself. Actually, the model that I used for the bias is actually, uh, I, I don't use the, the, the feature vectors here, but I just use the the, the scores of a machine, other machine learning model uh, in here. So I use it uh, the other machine learn learning model as a uh, dimension reduction uh, step. So uh, so this is actually uh, the, the the thing that uh, I do. And to show you how big the effect of that bias is, just uh, that I introduced that that I showed you uh, as in the data. I have uh, this uh, uh, this slide, and it's about the left panel. Uh, I created three data sets, uh, one with 25% uh, positives, one with 50% positives, and one with 75% uh, positives. And what you see is that when I vary um, in the test sets, uh, the, the, the proportion positives from 10% to 90%, you see actually that there is always a big bias in there when the proportion in the test set is not equal to the proportion in the uh, in the training set. And that's really a problem. The maximum likelihood uh, method that I uh, created actually solves this problem. So, uh, and uh, you don't have uh, have that bias anymore. So, uh, 
yeah so so i think this, this is uh, really an important step uh, forward in uh, in uh, um, in using machine learning algorithms that you that you see that there are is actually so somewhere a a um, yeah, uh, a problem when using these methods. Uh, it, it, you cannot just use it and assume that everything is correct. So uh, there are two ways uh, of using uh, these uh, classifiers. Uh, wait a minute. I'm sorry, my um, my iPad is uh, disturbing me. So uh, <laughs> Siri started started to think that I was asking a question to it. So. Uh, so there are two ways uh, of uh, looking at uh, these uh, these methods: uh, one for classification and one for quantification. Uh, and in the classification method, we use uh, thresholds uh, or maybe an argmax. At the moment, that we have more categories. Uh, when you use uh, deep learning, uh, very often uh, softmax is used, which is actually also a sort of argmax. And uh, another way of using uh, uh, the, the results of the classifier is actually. Uh, calculating the expected value by adding up the probabilities. One is called uh, classification, the other one is uh, called quantification, and uh, the field of quantification is actually developing at this moment. So uh, people are looking more and more at quantification uh, methods uh, when using uh, machine learning. The problem is also when, suppose you have a NACE code uh, and you want to uh, automatically classify companies and you use a machine learning algorithm, a classifier, you're going to, to threshold it, then you know that you do a lot of misclassifications, and you are going to um, uh, you're going to take all those errors with you in the end result, and uh, that's actually something you don't want to do. So uh, so somehow you have to find other ways of using uh, using this uh, these uh, classifiers when using them in a in a statistical process. Okay. Are there any questions uh, 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 until now? Um, because then I can drink a little bit water again. So, not yet, Marco. But okay. uh, if somebody throws a question, I'll let you know. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is that uh, that uh, curious title I had in my uh, introduction already: the asymptotical behavior towards annotated, annotated data. And it's actually something that I started to observe when a colleague of mine uh, was uh, humanly uh, annotating data, which was not really clear, even not for the annotators itself. And I, I, a lot of people said that they didn't know what, in what category uh, the item actually should be. And I started to think, hey, wait a minute. Uh, if we have a human annotator who isn't sure about the, the class in which a certain item is, then we are actually going to learn that to a machine learning algorithm. So somehow we have to deal with that. So the problem uh, starts uh, within uh, human perception again. And uh, in the paper, uh, Pete and I uh, wrote uh, in uh, the survey statistician, uh, we, we call this bias uh, introduced in human beings perceptual and uh, perception bias. Uh, in this slide, you see the perceptual bias because I'm a, a, a perceptual, uh, I come from perception, so we always work with perceptual things. The fact that we don't see straight lines here, where that, whereas there are straight lines in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the, the ground truth. The fact that we don't see the ta these two tables are of the same size, whereas in the ground truth, they are of the same size. We don't see these persons as being uh, equally tall, whereas in the, the ground truth they could be uh, equally tall uh, if this building was uh, actually uh, strangely formed. And the fact that we sometimes see an Eskimo here and a face and another time tells us that the perceptual system is playing tricks with us all the time. And when we are going to use these uh, uh, the, the, the humans uh, to annotate data, then we don't know for sure if the visual systems of those human beings who are annotating the data are actually playing tricks with us. So, uh, so somehow, this is really a problem. Also, uh, the, the, the perception bias, which is about the fact that people are uh, uh, living in a certain, certain culture, have their, so, say, their own opinions about things, have their own uh, uh, values, uh, make sure that they interpret things in a different way. 
then uh, then is plainly uh, uh, at uh, at their side. So so somehow we are putting a lot of biases of people, um, uh, cultural biases, but also perceptual biases. We are putting them in all uh, in that that training material. So. Uh, so the question that I would like to ask is: uh, To what extent is the true is the observed ground truth? And I put them uh, between uh, uh, quotes quotation marks. Uh, and how far is that real? I mean, it, uh, uh, it, it's it's strange that we just assume them to be real. But when you see how much we are influenced by uh, by our um, uh, by our environment, by our visual system, in interpreting things. Uh, um, it, it's really a, a good question. To what extent is the observed ground truth real? And uh, when you start thinking about it, that maybe that uh, that uh, that it is not real, then uh, you can actually ask yourself uh, if a machine learning algorithm could ever outperform uh, an annotator, because you are actually learning uh, the machine learning algorithm, the mistakes an annotator makes. Because of all uh, all this uh, all these biases, so so I started to worry <laughs> about using uh, machine learning algorithms when we are using uh, human uh, annotated data, and the the, the, the main problem is, is actually this: uh, um, uh, how can we ever detect these errors, these errors which are introduced by the annotator, when the annotator is actually uh, creating the training set? The test set, and in certain cases also a validation set. These are actually the same. The, 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 these are actually data coming from the same annotators who are making these kinds of mistakes. So, and and yeah. So how could we detect these errors? Um, um, and uh, in, in my opinion, if we stay with the, the humanly uh, annotated data, we can never uh, detect this uh, these errors. So we have to find different data sources. To look at to see if we uh, can uh, can uh, can say something about these errors. So, the asymptotical behavior towards annotated data is about the fact that the machine learning algorithm will never be able to perform better than uh, than a human uh, a human observer. And uh, whereas we actually wanted to outperform humans, uh, we wanted to make less mistakes because that's the reason why we automate a lot of things uh, in statistical processes so that we don't have that human uh, involvement anymore. But even now, when you use human annotated data, the, the weakest link is still the human, the human in that process. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's a problem. And uh, I'm actually going quite fast, so... Uh, <laughs> Take another sip. Um, then there is a, a, another important point, uh, and it is actually about the representativity of uh, training sets. And actually, this isn't about the representativity itself. Um, well, it is, but uh, the, the, the thing that happens at the, at the moment that you don't have a representative training set for your machine learning algorithm, um, you actually I, my statement is that uh, at that moment you're uh, you're not able to find the right features for your problem, um, and um, this has to do with the fact that uh, in some cases you have really minor classes, rare cases, and Pete will uh, give some demonstrations on them. When you look at innovative uh, companies and uh, uh, artificial intelligence companies uh, in the Netherlands. Um, these are actually rare cases. These are minor classes, and um, they have uh, some features. But because of the fact that you don't have that many uh, examples of them, uh, you won't be able uh, to to find the right features. So, uh, so it's uh, it's something that is really comparable with uh, with uh, um, what we see when making statistics. Um, uh, our population uh, is. Um, Heterogeneous uh, is a big heterogeneous population. Uh, each and every time that we are doing uh, doing uh, research, also when we do surveys, we are looking at a very heterogeneous uh, population. And the way we overcome this problem within uh, survey statistics is actually by stratifying uh, um, uh, the population and taking random samples out of that stratified uh, population. We are going to make the 
the population more homogeneous by putting it uh, by, by creating different strata and putting more homogeneous items within each and every stratum. And uh, actually, this is also something uh, that we could do with uh, machine learning. And this is something uh, where, we, where we are trying to start uh, some, some uh, research now in the Netherlands, where we're going to see if we could create such a population, uh, so, such, a, such a sample based on a stratified random sampling uh, uh, method. And um, the, the, the question then is, uh, how do we find the, the, the right set of features? So uh, um, the, 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 how do we find the right set of uh, strata? I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, you can use uh, clustering techniques, like uh, the, the just normal machine learning techniques, where you say, OK, I have my, uh, my features. So uh, I have my, my uh, information about each and every item. And I'm going to see if I can find clusters uh, which are much more homogeneous within that population of these uh, of these features. You can also use background information, like we do in uh, making statistics. But the goal is to find strata which are much more homo homogeneous, uh, and uh, to see if when we apply that stratification to that population and get annotated data back, uh, if uh, we can uh, actually uh, do a, uh, a better uh, job in uh, training the, those uh, models. And there are different ways of doing that. You can actually use uh, machine learning algorithms which uh, uh, have some weighing incorporated. So uh, where you can just put a weight in your, uh, in your, in your model. Uh, for instance, um, in uh, logistic regression, you can just put a weight to each and every item uh, that you train uh, against. Or, uh, and that's uh, one uh, I, I like much more, is use multiple models, one model for each stratum. And th th these are actually decisions we want to, to, uh, to investigate in this piece of research. And something that is related to that is uh, something uh, which is called hierarchical uh, classification. Suppose I have, for instance, a nace or maybe a, a, a code uh, for, uh, for goods. Uh, then normally a machine learning algorithm will learn at the lowest level, at the, the least of, uh, of, uh, of the, 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 the classification. So I have some text and I know that one text is about 1.2, the other text is about 2.2.1, and the uh, yet another text is about 2.1.1, and, and, and so on and so on. So we are classifying against the leaves. But what they are doing in this hierarch hierarchical classification is actually saying, okay, I have uh, my complete corpus, and I'm going to classify the corpus first uh, against the, the, the highest level of that classification. So uh, in this case, one and two. And after I did that, I'm going to take the, the ones that are classified uh, for, for, for one, and I'm going to classify them uh, against, uh, again, one level deeper. And I continue like that until I reach my leaves. And I'm going to use if, I can assume that I have three probabilities, and um, my uh, ideal observer model shows that when you do it correctly, that you have three pro probabilities, um, then you can actually uh, calculate the probability of an item being 1.1, 1.2, 2.1.1, 2.1.2, .1, and so forth. So in, in that case, you can actually do uh, your classification uh, much better. And, your models are really specific. So the models are much simpler when you use them. And they don't have that, that peculiar problem of uh, uh, inhomogeneities in your, your training set. So uh, it, it, uh, it, you won't be, uh, even if uh, uh, the 2.2 the, the set here is really small, it will still be able to learn uh, uh, about the differentiation between 2.2.1 and 2.2.2. Uh, because of the fact that the, 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 the sets are much more specific, uh, there are much less uh, uh, important features in there, and it will be able to pick up uh, the, the, the small signals much better. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, the, the thing I hope for when we are going to, to apply this also in a more stratified sampling method, so that we can uh, get much better uh, machine learning algorithms. Then my last part of the presentation, is about explainable AI. One of the important things um, most of uh, the um, uh, statistical methodologists tell you 
that people should do before they are using machine learning algorithms is have an explanation why the machine learning algorithm is actually working like you uh, you want it to. And uh, this is actually a very hard proof you have to give because uh, when you look at, for instance, deep learning uh, algorithms, so deep neural networks, they are absolutely absolutely not explainable. Um, you cannot uh, uh, follow um, from the input layer exactly what is happening to the output layer, and it's it's uh, impossible for us to track it. Sorry. So somehow we have to find methods uh, to make sure that we uh, can actually explain those uh, machine learning algorithms. And uh, uh, within explainable AR, there are actually three stages defined where you can uh, explain an algorithm. You can uh, start with explaining it in the pre-modeling uh, uh, phase. It's actually also um, um, uh, the stratification of your data is already a sort of pre-modeling explanation. You are going to look at which clusters of data, which background information can be used to cluster the data uh, in such a way that they are more homogeneous. So, we, so this is also pre-modeling ex uh, explainability. Um, and it is about understanding and describing the data. Um, then I will go to the post-modeling uh, explainability. I'm sorry for the dog. Um, uh, the post-modeling explainability is about the fact that when you have a machine learning algorithm where you don't understand what is going, in, uh, going on inside it, that you are going to, to def define some experiments on that machine learning uh, uh, algorithm uh, to actually find out what is actually going on in there. And uh, this is actually the part where I, as a uh, psychophysicist, uh, got really happy because these are the techniques that we uh, also used uh, in uh, psychophysics. So what you do, for instance, is you say, okay, I'm going to take uh, one variable at the input, or maybe a, a linear combination of uh, variables at the input, and I'm going to vary them uh, from a low value to a high value, that linear combination, and I'm going to see uh, how the behavior changes of uh, the uh, of uh, of the, the 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 algorithm. So, uh, what does it classify when that linear combination of those variables is low, and what does it classify when that linear combination of these variables is high, and how does it change uh, when I gra gradually change it from low to high? And and th this gives us insight about why the machine learning algorithm is actually taking uh, these uh, uh, these decisions. So there's also a way uh, you can deal with it. Another way, and uh, this is the one a lot of uh, methodologists uh, think, uh, uh, actually think, is by explainable modeling. So only use models which can be explained. Uh, the good thing about it is that they exist. Uh, for instance, um, decision trees are really explainable because they, uh, they take the decisions based on uh, uh, values of items which uh, which uh, is in the data. So so you can really uh, have, uh, you, you can just translate it into if-then uh, constructions. So that's actually a very good way to explain your, your algorithms. Um, but the problem is that uh, when your data is getting more and more complex, uh, these methods cannot uh, be used anymore. And uh, so uh, for that, sometimes uh, hybrid models are used so that you use deep learning to find some sort of uh, lower dimensional uh, um, uh, features. And uh, at finally, you are going to use decision trees to make the final decision. Um, um, uh, and other ma methods are also can also be used for that. But, um, but, but it's, it's hard. And, and um, uh, in my opinion, you are making yourself your life really miserable when you are going to uh, uh, only look at explainable modeling. I think post-modeling explainability and pre-modeling explainability already uh, help a lot in explaining why the model makes the decisions. And then I come to um, a, a way I like to look at explainable AI. And um, it has to do with the fact that when the best way to validate a model is by understanding the model. And that's also a part of explainable AI. And this is actually the basis. <laughs> this is where it's all about in explainable AI. Uh, you want to understand, uh, you want to validate a model and you are trying to understand why it is doing what it does. And 
Someone who formulated it already in 82 was David Marr, um, someone working in visual perception, a uh, neuroscientist uh, and engineer, uh, who started to look in a different way at the human visual system. And he describes in his book, Vision, um, uh, that there are three levels at which an information processing device should be described to be fully understood. And I will work from the lower part to the upper part here. So I don't start here at the upper, upper side, but I start here at the lower side. And the first, uh, the, the first level is hardware implementation. He called it hardware implementation because he was looking at the human brain. And uh, when you look at the human brain, uh, then um, um, the, the, the platform you are working on is uh, the, the, the human brain itself or a computer where you are simulating stuff. Uh, he called it uh, hardware implementation, but I would like to, to, to get rid of the uh, hardware and a lot of scholars also got rid of the, the, the hardware term. And it's actually about how is the algorithm realized? Which implementation decisions do you have to make before um, uh, for implementing uh, the, uh, the, the algorithm? Um, a level up, you have the representation and algorithm, the design pattern. These are, this is uh, what we normally do when we describe an algorithm. We have uh, preconditions, postconditions, and we have some uh, sort of description about what the algorithm does. But the thing is that um, uh, a lot of these, uh, these uh, descriptions of algorithms don't explain why the algorithm is actually working in the right way. And that's the first level about the computational theory. How does the model relate to re reality? Why is it that this model is actually doing the right thing? And, uh, and uh, he formulated it in three uh, questions. What is the goal of the algorithm of uh, the computation? Why is uh, the, the computation appropriate? And what is the logic of the strategy? And this is all about how is this model uh, seated in the physical world, in the ground truth that, that it is actually operating in? So uh, that's uh, that's actually the, the 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 main thing that it is about. I learned a lot about it when I started to reread uh, uh, David Marr uh, as a methodologist, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's really a good book. Um, so the computational uh, theory um, Marr himself says about it is trying to understand perception by studying only neurons. In this case, neurons. Uh, it's like trying to understand bird flying by studying only feathers. So, um, and he, he hits the point really well here. When I look at a feather, I won't be able to understand why the bird is flying. I have to see how the feathers are connected to each other and how they are moving in the air and how the aerodynamics is of those feathers to understand how, how the, the, the bird is flying. So you really have to look at the environment where that those feathers are actually working in and how they are working together. So in AI, uh, very often the how question is confused with the why question. So when I ask a uh, someone who made a machine learning model uh, why the model is working, it actually answers the question how the model is working. And that's actually the main problem about the explainability. People don't go to the why question, they stick to the how question and uh, tell me over and over again uh, all works and it, for them it's fine. I mean, uh, most of them are engineers, and engineers are are uh, trained to uh, describe how something functions and not why something functions. So, uh, but the why uh, uh, the the why question is uh, really important. Why are these features uh, selected instead of how are these features selected? That, that is the right question. Why is it so that when I'm looking at um, um, at um, for instance, uh, innovative companies, why certain features are in there and some, some features are not in there. It's not the question how, how these features are selected. The question is why the features are selected. And then my final question to, to, to all of you, and maybe it's a good question for a discussion, is does it matter how complex the model is when we use such a strategy? When we use a strategy where we try to understand um, uh, when, when we start to ask the why question and start to understand um, uh, why the system is working like it does. And uh, in my opinion, th this is all where explainable AI is about, explaining why the thing is doing uh, what it does. And uh, when you look at the original scheme that I had about uh, explainable AI, then you see that there's a lot about 
um, engineering, a lot about uh, technology, uh, with uh, a lot of things that I like in the pre-modeling explainability, but but it's still a lot about uh, the the uh, the engineering part and not about answering the question. But why is it that this model does what uh, what it should do and uh, doesn't do anything else? So uh, so that's uh, that's the main thing. And then I come to the conclusion, and uh, I see that uh, that I did a great job again. So, uh, um, so I come back to the quality of uh, official statistics and uh, the relevance, the accuracy, the accessibility, the clarity, the coherence, and the comparability. And all of these questions um, have to do somehow with the subjects that uh, that I uh, um, that I explained: uh, clarity with explainable uh, AI accuracy with the bias uh, and i can continue like that this and a lot of these uh, these things are not solved uh, by um, uh, machine learning engineers by machine learning researchers which uh, which are working in this field they are actually looking at, at things that we also need uh, better algorithms to classify stuff to to uh, do regressions in more complex environments but they don't ask uh, they don't answer the questions uh, uh, that we need to answer the question why is it working like it does uh, how can i reduce this bias what is actually the machine learning algorithm actually calcul calculating like i showed you with the ideal observer model and these are all new research topics within machine learning that appear when we apply it to official statistics and these are also topics that have to be solved before we can actually use uh, these machine learning uh, algorithms in official statistics in my opinion i mean uh, we still can use them and uh, peter will show in in uh, the next uh, uh, talk uh, uh, how you can use them uh, but still yeah, there is a lot of research to do, and um, uh, with that, I would uh, give the, 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 the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, first, for keeping to time, and also by uh, presenting us such a, um, a comprehensive and challenging uh, view of the potential for machine learning methods in the production for official statistics. We actually have good time uh, for questions to be presented. So I'll um, ask our the first uh, person who posted a question, Diogo Cruz, I think, um, uh, if he would like to open his uh, camera and microphone uh, to present his question. Diogo Cortis, I'm sorry. Diogo, are you there? I, I can't see Diogo. So I'll, I'll read his question. Nice explanation, Marco. That's a challenge in cognitive science. We study this phenomena as categorization problem. Depending on the problem, categories are more fuzzy. For example, we are working on an emotion recognition project in NLP. Annotators had difficulty categorizing more fuzzy emotions like disapproval, pride, versus simple emotions like love, happy. Annotators often don't even agree within themselves. If they annotate the same data point uh, within two weeks, they usually do not agree uh, even with their previous annotation. Would you like to comment on this one, Marco? Yeah, I like the example. And uh, if you don't mind, I will use it uh, during my next presentation because that's actually exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I also have an example like this. Uh, when I still was uh, in my PhD phase, uh, at a certain moment, uh, people from the Breast Cancer Institute in the Netherlands came to us Bunch. with Bunch. exactly the same problem. It's exactly the same uh, same thing. Uh, in that case, uh, radio radiologists uh, were actually looking at uh, at uh, mammograms, and uh, when they found a micro uh, calcification in them, they looked back uh, at the the image that was shot uh, two years earlier, and they actually saw the micro calcification, whereas they didn't see it in the first place. Uh, the world is full with all these kinds of examples, and uh, it. Uh, um, 
yeah, it, it, uh, it is exa exactly the reason why I don't think that uh, humanly annotated data uh, can be used per se. So, so that you should, uh, that that's actually the, the natural way to go. Uh, try to find other sources for them. So uh, I see that you agree, Diego. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I like, uh, I like the, the, the remark. Thank you. <laughs> Diogo, if Thank you, you want to unmute your mic, you can make an intervention if you want. Okay, uh, our next question comes from Jose Antonio. Um, Jose Antonio, would you like to um, make your question uh, yourself? Um, Pedro, I'm sorry, but uh, most of the audience cannot open their microphones, so we have okay. to read them. Jo only the co-hosts okay. mm -hmm. and organizers okay. can. So I'll okay. go ahead. Uh, now um, you can. Jose? Now, uh, excuse me, Pedro. Now uh, participants can unmute the mic if they want to speak. Okay, but I'll, I'll read this one from Jose Antonio. Very nice presentation. A question about asymptotic behavior. You cited visual cognition, values, and cultural issues as sources of bias in data classification. And what about the behavior of people that today are already contaminated by the algorithms of this of digital world that induce these classifications? Yeah, this is uh, mind blowing, <laughs> actually, <laughs> because um, yeah, uh, we um, from a traditional point of view, you always say uh, say okay, um, you have you have your. Uh, um, uh, your your population and that population has some behavior and you are going to measure the behavior and you are going to model the behavior and blah blah blah. Uh, but in this case, you have your algorithms again, who are, you, who are actually in the middle of the population, are actually influencing uh, uh, the the population again. It lets me think about um, um, one of the definitions we had uh, on uh, psychophysics. And I, I see that uh, I have a lot of people here who know uh, cognitive science a little bit, so or maybe even very good, maybe better than I do, uh, because I'm uh, already out of that business for t 20 years or something like that. But um, uh, and, and and it's actually something uh, where someone asked us, what is it actually about? And uh, one of the researchers said, well, it's actually about uh, a very distinguished uh, researcher, Jan Kundering, uh, came with that remark. Um, it's actually about the human being being part of uh, of a uh, environment and in two directions, bidirectional. So uh, the human being who is perceiving the world around him and is also manipulating the world around him. And actually, this is actually what uh, what what this remark is all about. We 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 create algorithms in certain cases, and I'm happy that we as a statistical office don't do that uh, already. We are creating algorithms in the, in the world which we are putting in the middle of a population. The models are actually trained uh, uh, on, uh, on something. There are mistakes in there, classification mistakes in there. And you're putting back those algorithms back in the population, the results of them, and influencing your population actually to... Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's even worse than what I was talking about in the, in the presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Marco. I, I will ask Marcelo Pita from CETIC to present his question. I think Marcelo can open his microphone. Thanks, Marco. Excellent presentation. It's just mm -hmm. a, 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 small, a simple question, also about the annotated data bias and errors. Considering the, the perception bias that you talked about, uh, the bias the, of the human classifier can can be related to culture, to to culture, to education, economic status, the humor of the day, and many other social variables. Mm -hmm. uh, when classifying an object, a test, a picture, mm -hmm. aren't these objects uh, also uh, filled with social aspects given by the producer of the objects? How can yeah. we do with that? How, how, how will, when will we be able to say that something is and something is not? Mm -hmm. so 
everybody can agree in a classification. Yeah, yeah, this, this is uh, one of the, the problems you your uh, people noticed already from the beginning of artificial intelligence. And uh, it's, it's really, really a big problem. Uh, one of these cool examples uh, that is used uh, that you have to uh, watch out uh, when training a neural network uh, was an example about um, um, a model that was trained by the American military to detect uh, uh, Russian tanks. And maybe a lot of people know this example, um, uh, where uh, the model was actually picking up um, the wrong thing. And they found out when they put it in the field and the thing didn't uh, recognize any Russian tank. And the reason was that all the pictures that were taken of the Russian tanks uh, by the, the spies uh, were taken by rain, uh, whereas the, 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 the American tanks were actually uh, uh, taken by sunshine because they were really pr proud about them. Uh, and you see already that there is a social aspect there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the collection of the data. And uh, uh, the fact that the, the spy in the field had to be very careful and uh, liked it when there was a cloudy day. Uh, whereas uh, um, uh, the, the, the own pride is actually telling you that you should be uh, demonstrate uh, them in uh, a nice as possible environment. And, and yeah, we always see stuff like that. For instance, the fact that we uh, that most pictures, when you are looking at pictures of uh, objects and, and uh, animals and stuff like that, that uh, they are uh, taken uh, with uh, aesthetic rules. The question is, is, is the model not actually learning those uh, aesthetic rules also, and what what, what happens when you present a, a picture which uh, doesn't uh, um, apply uh, th these aesthetic rules? Uh, does it still recognize what it should recognize? And uh, um, um, uh, what I was uh, the, the 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 pictures we are actually looking at are a lot of um, aerial pictures and uh, satellite pictures where you don't have that cultural problem. So, uh, but uh, yes, you really have to be careful. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank, you, Thank you for the nice uh, remark. Yeah. I have a question from Esperanza Magpante. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Can you mention examples in official stats where machine learning and AI were tested? I think you're, she wants to hear Pete, uh, Pete's presentation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I wanted to answer no, because Pete is going to explain them. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You have to wait for uh, uh, for after the break, and uh, Pete will uh, uh, mention uh, a lot of examples. So uh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. The next one is from Tiago Tavares. I'd like to share one recent presentation I did discussing the content moderation at scale mm -hmm. and the role of IA uh, slash machine learning in NLP in the management of freedom of expression online. He, he gives a, 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 the route for a PDF in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you, you have some comment, comment regarding this idea of moderation of content uh, for you know, sites which publish person's uh, comments or messages. Um. That, that's uh, that's a difficult one uh, to just uh, give uh, as a first shot. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I first need to to, to look at. Uh, I already opened the slides, so um, okay. um, I uh, I'm I'm happy to read it. So uh, so it's uh, um, maybe we could uh, get in touch and uh, talk about it uh, uh, later. So uh, yes. Um... Hmm? I don't see further questions, but maybe I'd like to ask Esperanza if she wants to um, make a comment directly. Esperanza, if, if you can open your microphone and, 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 and present yourself. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just appreciated the, the presentation. I have nothing more to add. Mm -hmm. I will just wait for uh, the additional information later on on the examples. I just want to share that in the area of ICT statistics, we are also considering the use of machine learning and AI to mm -hmm. sort of like estimate the data on, on internet use so that any learnings from this meeting will be greatly appreciated as well. 
Thank you very mm -hmm. much and congratulations for the presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, if I would give a command back now, I would actually make uh, Pete very angry because uh, of the fact that uh, <laughs> I'm going to tell stuff that he's going to talk about it. So uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks. Um, I have one last comment here. Let's see. This is, I think it's from Marcelo again. Uh, Marcelo, would you like to present your comment? Uh, 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 just one more, more, more comment, and uh, I would like you to comment about what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. I've been in some in some meetings where people talked about uh, the use of machine learning in justice. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of issues about that. And you talked a lot about features we need to use. The observation, pattern recognition, the induction and deduction part. What about sometimes uh, don't use some features because morally or ethically, we don't think mm -hmm. they should be used and they should be placed in, in sentences in the case of justice. Would it be the case of race, ethnicity, gender, uh, characteristics of, the, of a person that a machine learning algorithm may be uh, judging? but they should not be used to do that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, extracting some features of the test set in order to make the judgment of the machine learning better? Yes, that's uh, actually something Peter and I have a lot of discussions uh, with uh, some people working machine learning at Statistics Netherlands. Um, um, uh, when you already see that some features are actually really about the, 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 the thing that, uh, that, that we are talking about, uh, then, then start to use it. I actually have a, a very nice example, and I, I think I can uh, just share the example. And it was about uh, finding cocaine uh, in, um, in, uh, in containers which uh, come from uh, Colombia. And um, a machine learning algorithm came very fast to the conclusion that the, um, um, the, um, the, the, the cocaine was only in, um, in shipments uh, containing bananas. And so uh, at a certain moment, they started to uh, open all the, <laughs> all the containers containing bananas, and they didn't find that much uh, cocaine uh, <laughs> in there. So, uh, and the reason was, when you look at the, 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 the way those uh, containers travel uh, from the, the, the banana fields to the, uh, to the port of Rotterdam, in this case, uh, then you see that there are actually moments that uh, um, uh, drugs could be uh, put into the uh, containers uh, in, uh, during that, uh, that travel. And uh, it could be uh, um, uh, done in such a way that you couldn't recognize that container was open. And uh, so you see that machine learning algorithms, we, we actually can only use them when they overgeneralize. And uh, you, you see that uh, in a lot of fields. There is a big affair in the Netherlands uh, where people uh, received money, which uh, uh, first they received money that they shouldn't receive. Uh, then uh, a machine learning algorithm, a data scientist started to look at the problem. And at a certain moment, a lot of people were prosecuted uh, for uh, um, uh, for uh, asking for the money without uh, them uh, 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 being able to apply for that. And, and uh, they received the money at the end. But yeah, and they were uh, prosecuted uh, for, uh, for, for being, uh, doing bad things, but actually they weren't doing anything bad. But the machine learning algorithm overgeneralized uh, to the wrong uh, features. And, and uh, that, that is, that is what I mean when I look at, uh, at uh, how Mar looks at, uh, at a, a perceptual uh, a mechanism, at a perceptual uh, system, uh, how it is in the middle of the real world. I mean, I can think about uh, a very good uh, machine learning algorithms which, which do a lot of good things with the data, which are able to, to separate uh, the, the goods from the bad. But at the moment that I put it in reality, then it is a complete different story. And uh, 
uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 a fact, and uh, that's something data scientists have really have to 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 be careful about. So uh, I think you are absolutely right. Thank you for the wonderful remark. That uh, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone for presenting your questions and Marco for the excellent and inspiring presentation. We will now break for 15 minutes. Uh, we will reconvene at 11.25 to hear uh, Pete's uh, presentation, okay? Thank you again, Marco. You're welcome. In 15 minutes. Mm -hmm.
Well, um, folks, this is about time uh, we re-engage for our workshop. Um, this is my time to introduce the next speakers, uh, the next speaker for today. I would like to give the floor to Piet Das. Professor Dr. Piet Das is a senior methodologist at Statistics Netherlands, where he leads the research on big data. He is a professor by special appointment on big data in official statistics at the Eindhoven University of Technology, where his work focuses on the development of big data methodology. Piet also teaches big data online at Statistics Netherlands, the University of Utrecht, University of Maryland, and the University of Mannheim. Piet, you have uh, 50 minutes, and if needed, I will um, let you know when you are about five minutes before your time is up. And uh, without further ado, uh, Piet, the floor is yours. And okay. I apologize if, apologize if I didn't say your name with the exact accent, but sorry, I, I'm not can, Dutch. <laughs> you, can, you can call me Pedro, that's, that's, the, same, uh, that's the same name. <laughs> I will share my screen. So uh, this is the second part of the presentation and, and it's a logical follow-up of, of everything Marco has told you about. It's, it's about uh, the application of uh, big data and official statistics. And I will start by uh, on the things we have learned on, on how to use machine learning. And we, we use machine learning in a much stricter way because all the things that Marco observed and talked about, uh, we learned how to apply it. So I'll start with an example on how to use machine learning in official statistics. And this example is the use of the texts on websites for official statistics production. I will focus on the detection of innovative companies as an example, because we've done a lot of work on that. And, and, and I can show you how we checked everything and how we validated everything and how we, we stepped from induction and went to deduction. And then the next part of the presentation is on a number of applications of big data for official statistics, a number of the successes, and I'll end up hopefully on time with a list of uh, 14 examples. So let's start with the example. Uh, a lot of companies have a website and the idea we had is can we use the text or the wordings they use on the website to determine if a company is innovative or not? Uh, and, and that's easy because that means we can uh, scrape a lot of web pages. That's very easy. You can easily write uh, some code that uh, extracts the text from uh, web pages. And we looked at the potential on, on, on how these web pages could be used, for instance, for the innovative character of a company. And, and that's interesting not only for large companies, I will show you, uh, but also for small companies. And this idea that we had uh, means that we started inductively. We had, we had an idea, uh, we, we thought about it, and then uh, we, we said, okay, let's start. And that means we have to start with data, and that means you start in an inductive way. And we see that gradually during our exercises, we will uh, become more deductive. Uh, the interesting thing is that you need a, a high quality data set to do this. That's what Marco already explained. That it's very important. You need to start with the best input you can have to test it, this idea. The interesting thing is that in Europe, there's a community innovation survey, the, the CIS survey, I will call it in the remainder of this presentation. And that's a survey that's European standardized. So it's sent around in, in a lot of uh, other European countries They use exactly the same questionnaire. And the questions are, focused on determining the innovati uh, innovativeness of a company. And in the Netherlands, it's sent every other year to a sample of 10,000 companies. The very large companies always get this questionnaire, but there's somewhat smaller companies, uh, that's a sample. And those companies to have to be included in this survey uh, uh, need at least 10 or more working persons. And that's a very important thing because our idea is to use this questionnaire but the thought uh, uh, occurred prior to this that it would be great if we can develop a method that could also be applied to small companies such as startups because that's where innovation starts. Can we develop something that can be applied not only to large companies, the companies with 10 or more working persons, but also to small companies. That's the information we have. So we have the response of the sample uh, for the SIS survey. 
so we can use that in our training set but it's essential if you use a website to be 100 percent sure that that website is the website of that company or uh, you have sent the survey to so we needed a link to the website and uh, fortunately in a european project they developed a url search approach where starting from the name of the company and some additional information you can uh, uh, look up the uh, uh, official website of the company but to be absolutely sure we, we we did lots and lots of manual checking so of the uh, of the response of the 10,000 we checked uh, every response to to make absolutely sure that we have the correct website of that company prior to starting on this which was already a lot of work so that means we have a good start uh, you can certainly call this a representative data set at least for the large companies, because it's a it's it's a sample used by statistical office, and we have the response of that, and we make sure that the link between the unit and its website is completely checked. So, uh, so that's that's a good uh, point. Then we scraped the data, extracted it, and created a machine learning based model. So we transformed the text into uh, into features that we uh, uh, developed the model on, and after doing that, and I won't go into much detail here because it's a demonstration of how you can use machine learning. We ended up eventually with a model uh, that was able to uh, uh, classify the websites of the companies with an accuracy of 88%. So 88% compared to the results of the uh, CIS survey. So that's fairly good. Um, and and we, we did that by training it on an 80% random sample. So you have those, uh, the response of the 10,000 companies, 80% of that is used to train a model and 20% is uh, independently used to test it. And, and the test result was 88% accurate. And, and the ratio of positive and negative examples in our training set is comparable uh, with those in the SIS survey. So that, that should all be okay. But we made some uh, choices uh, uh, during developing a model and those are important to mention because I will come back to them later. Uh, we found out that there are a number of, of companies that have websites with hardly any words. They have great movies on that, but there are not a lot of words there. And, and if you have only a few words on a website, then you can't uh, really build a reliable classifier on that. So websites with less than 10 words were not used. So we only used the websites with 10 or more words. And we did some standard pre-processing. Um, anybody familiar with, with text mining will recognize these. And anybody not will, will quickly learn what the standard approach is now. You remove any stop words because in principle, they are not informative, certainly for this task. You removed all numbers, any punctuation mark and very small words were removed. And we removed also several other words later on, which, which are, it's interesting looking at the question in the discussion with Marco. So the model was developed. Oh, great. The fact that it's 88% accurate means that there is a relation between words, particular words used on the website, and the fact that the company is innovative according to the uh, classification results on the SIS survey. And you can look in, in, inside the model and see what the words with the most important weights are. So the positive words with high weights in the model. And this is the English translation. In principle, a website in the Netherlands is usually in Dutch, but there are English websites as well. And we tested it, but we decided to develop a single model for any, any language in a website, which is either Dutch or English. The, these are the translated words. The com is the most uh, word with the highest weight, which is indicative for a company. System, inspiration, data, technology, and analysis are clear examples of things that certainly indicate an innovative company. Do is a bit strange here. But that happens if you use machine learning and you throw in lots and lots of words. Uh, apparently, it it it, uh, it it has an association with uh, the word "do" in uh, innovative companies, and also the language is important. The, the model adding language as an additional feature really improved the performance of the model, and it in uh, it indicated that if a website is in English, then the company has a higher chance of being classified as innovative. So, and that's something you would expect. An English-oriented website means a company that's not only oriented in the Netherlands, but also to other European countries. Now, we have uh, innovative companies, but you also have non-innovative companies. And, and clearly, non-innovative companies is a very diverse group. And that's shown in the words as well. But if you look at the words, it suggests though those are mainly companies that sell products or, or 
are regular shops. So sale, buy, powered shape, exclusive or all. Things that appear there. Create is a bit strange to be included as, as a negative word, but apparently it is. Perhaps it's used by a lot of non-innovative companies and sort of uh, acts like a buzzword. But this gives an indication on, on the first idea, you're, you're starting to validate what your model is actually doing. You try to interpret what's going on. And overall, it seems to make sense what the, what the words that the machine learning model is picking up. Um, so we did our first validation uh, uh, after uh, uh, checking the model. Uh, so we decided, okay, we have developed the model on a small limited set of large companies. Let's scrape everything because at this point in time in the Netherlands, we had, uh, we could link a lot of the websites to the companies in our business register. So we were able to scrape a lot of the websites of the large companies. And they were excluded from our training and test sets. So this is an independent check. Uh, we scraped around uh, 37,000 companies and we classify them. And, and I'm showing a plot here with the chance of being innovative. So instead of a classify uh, using it as a negative, as a non-innovative or innovative company, it produces a number between uh, zero and one. Uh, so it shows the, the chance of being classified as innovative, although you might discuss if it's an exact chance, but the plot uh, that came out of it, so by classifying the 30, uh, 37,000 companies was a, had a nice U-shape. So I was really happy when I saw this. I thought, wow, it's the U-shape indicates a clear group on the left, the non-innovative companies, and a clear group on the right, the innovative companies. In the middle, there are companies that are classified with a value in between zero and one, but it's clear that there's a uh, that the model is able to clearly separate those two groups, and and uh, and that that looks really nice. This is something you would dream of, but in a perfect world, uh, the the values in the middle would be a bit lower. But it's nice. So really, uh, all things look very promising at this point in time. And then that means our idea uh, seems to work at least for the large companies. And then, but you're still in sort of in the inductive part of your process. But then you, you have the, the theory, uh, could the model be used to detect small innovative companies as well? So uh, could we generalize this? This is the start of, of, of deduction actually going on here because you develop a hypothesis. So you're stepping out of your uh, inductive cycle and you ask yourself the question, can it be more uh, generalized, this approach we have? Because this is, that is what you essentially want as a statistician at the National Statistical Office. So deductive reasoning kicks in here. Okay, let's do some quick tests if, if, if that model would work. Uh, uh, the easiest and interesting test you, uh, you can do if you look at small companies is look for small companies that are probably have a high chance of being innovative. And, and we looked at startups in the Netherlands and there are lots of websites that contain lists of startups and their associated websites. So we scraped a, a set of 900 websites, throw them in the classifier in the same way we process all our data. And we found that 92% of them are innovative. So I thought that's nice because that means our original model uh, can also be applied to detect uh, innovative uh, small companies and to make sure that not every uh, small company is classified as innovative. We also, uh, looked at the websites of small companies included in the Dutch business register with a linked website and we classified them as well. And there we found that according to our model, 33% was innovative. So clear there are different groups of small companies here and our model is able to uh, discern them uh, as well. So we had a nice external validation again, uh, showing that, uh, that this approach uh, seemed to work well. So. Clearly, this indicates that in general, there seems to be a difference between the wordings used in the websites of innovative companies compared to the non-innovative companies in the Netherlands. So uh, uh, the, the funny thing is if you have a huge amount of data, you can create lots and lots of nice visualizations. So we had classified, essentially we have linked every company in our business register with the accompanying website, at least for, for which they were possible if they have a website, we scraped all those websites. So let's make a map of where the location is of all our classified innovative companies. And we can link them at the municipality level because we have the address information, but also at the zip code level. 
at the municipality level, and I'm sure not a lot of people are familiar with the Netherlands, but this is how the Netherlands looks like. And there are clearly large uh, uh, bubbles uh, on this plot, and large uh, bubbles means lots and lots of innovative companies uh, located in this municipality, and the largest bubble is indicative of, our, uh, of Amsterdam, the, the capital of the Netherlands. And if you compare uh, that number, the number of innovative companies, compared to the number of inhabitants or people that live in Amsterdam or the number of businesses, it's clear that if you look at other municipalities, that uh, a much higher number of uh, uh, innovative companies are located in Amsterdam uh, uh, than in the other uh, in the other municipalities. So clearly, Amsterdam is a hotspot regarding uh, innovation. But it also shows a lot of other locations. And if you look at the ratio between the number of innovative companies for different municipalities, and especially for municipalities that have universities or an applied university, there, then the number of innovative companies is clearly higher than uh, for the other municipalities. So again, a confirmation of the idea that our model is really picking up something indicative of uh, innovation. And, and especially for Amsterdam, because we have so much information, you can even create a more detailed map. You can create a, a map that uh, indicate, indicates the number of innovative companies at the zip code four level. That's essentially the most detailed level we are allowed to publish uh, in the Netherlands. And zip code or postcode uh, areas that are clearly brown in this picture of Amsterdam uh, means that there are lots and lots of innovative companies there. And these areas are known to inhabit uh, startup incubators, organizations that support startups in the initial phase and, and, and say, okay, you can come into our building and have a room there, start working on your innovative ideas. So they are essentially hotspots in the, in the municipality. And that's picked up by a model. And even at the, uh, the, 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 much, the, the most detailed level, it still it still makes sense. So that that's again supporting the idea that our model is really picking up something associated with innovation. So that's great. Then you come to the next hypothesis, can because you want to test it more and more. If you have a model and if you can identify uh, the number of uh, large and small companies in the Netherlands based on that text, can you use that model to estimate the number of large companies? And for the large companies, we have an official statistical publication. So we know what that publication says about it. What will happen if we use the model to do that as well? And we used uh, and we try to include as much companies as possible. I'm, I'm a really uh, somebody who likes to do uh, census-like approaches because it's it's all about big data. Try to include, and try to link as accurate as possible all websites to all businesses in. Uh, uh, in the business register and then estimate the number of large companies first and then the number of small innovative companies. So we had about around 850,000 websites linked to the companies in our business register. So let's do that for the large companies. Uh, but if I would show you the exact number of, of businesses classified, the number of large companies, that's not the number uh, uh, you should look at because we know that the model has bias. That's what Marco told you about. So we need to correct it for the bias. And where we looked at was an approach developed by a colleague of mine, Quinton Mertens. He wrote that down in his PhD thesis. Because in principle, uh, the model is 88% accurate. That means 12% is misclassified. And the misclassification from a machine learning perspective is always of either a false positive or a false negative. Uh, the, 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 uh, a company that's innovative is classified as non-innovative in the other way around. If the ratio between the false positives and false negatives is identical, then there is no issue. But our model has a tendency to slightly overestimate or, or to slightly produce more false negative than false positive. So we need to correct for that. And our colleague Quinton has developed a method for that. So we applied it. That means the number uh, of uh, innovative companies increases. Then we had to include an estimate of the number of innovative companies that had a website with less than 10 words. We very detailedly looked at those websites and those words, if they were really different from uh, if there were specific subgroups in those uh, 
in 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 those uh, uh, groups of websites that was not the case so we decided okay that will probably then be the same ratio as in the websites with more than 10 words so that means an increase in the number of innovative companies again and because we had a sys survey and we can because we manually checked if the correct website was found or, or uh, linked to the correct business we also found that there are a number that are a very small number but there is a small number of innovative companies that doesn't have a website and we also check that for small companies as well by doing a small phone survey and in the end uh, we estimated that the number of innovative companies without a website is 0.01 percent so that's a very small amount but it's something to take care of if we correct all that and combine all the information for the large companies uh, what do we end up with? The CIS survey in the Netherlands says 19,916 innovative companies plus or minus 680. That's the confidence interval here. And for the um, web based text estimate, we end up with 90,276 uh, innovative large companies plus or minus 190. We did a bootstrap method to determine it and repeated the whole procedure a thousand times. If you look at those numbers and, and look at the confidence intervals, it's clear that there's an overlap between those numbers and essentially means that we're able to replicate the findings of the SIS server by looking at website text, which is great. And I thought, okay, that means we've proven everything, but then we ended up with quite a lot of discussions with colleagues, is everything was correct or not? Uh, but in principle, this shows that looking at the, the websites and the text is a great way, an alternative way to uh, obtain information that you could uh, without sending a survey to the company. And we principle classified every website that was linked to a company. If you look at the number of small innovative companies and there is no official uh, number on that in the Netherlands, uh, our web text based method says 33,599. But that's only for the companies with two or more working persons, up to the number of uh, 10, because if it's larger, it's included in the, in the SIS survey. Why do we focus on the larger ones here? Because we saw some odd behavior. If a company has one or less uh, working persons, so that's, that's what we call uh, uh, self-employed or semi-self-employed companies, then the U-shape we saw uh, for the large innovative companies uh, we saw that for the uh, innovative companies with two or more uh, working persons, but for the smaller ones, there was a clear peak around 0 0.8 included as well. So clearly this group differ differed from all the other uh, uh, examples. So that means that this also indicates that model might be off here. And, and because of this odd behavior, we decided to okay, go, let's only focus on the companies with two or more working persons because that seems, those companies seem to have the same behavior as the large companies. The, the same uh, uh, self-employed didn't. So there was a clear issue there. That's a downside of applying the model. Uh, but you can even ask a more general question. If we have a model and it seems to work well in the Netherlands and, and, and there are lots of pluses here that it seems to work well, could you apply this approach also to detect innovative companies in other uh, European countries, because the CIS survey that we use is a European standardized survey. So wouldn't it be great if you could apply this to other countries as well? Um, so that's another validation. And, and in principle, when we wrote this down uh, during a literature study, we discovered a, a paper of Kina and Lenz that was uh, eventually published in 2019 where they describe a very similar approach. They use the text on websites of German companies to determine if they are innovative or not, which means you can already, uh, this has already been done in Germany. So that's another example of, of, of something that indicates, oh, website texts are very uh, informative. We had a, an intern in Flanders, Statistics Flanders. As Flanders is the upper part of Belgium where in principle they speak the same language as the Dutch people do. And they, uh, uh, we assisted them in their research and they essentially confirmed that also in that part of Europe, text on websites can be used to determine if a company is innovative or not. So that's great. 
uh, we thought we had a, a, an intern as well, and, and we had a good cooperation with Sweden. So we decided, oh, let, could this intern uh, develop such an approach and test such an approach in Sweden as well? And, and he was able to do that. But our results were not confirmed. So in Sweden, clearly the behavior is different, and uh, which annoyed me a bit in the beginning. But, but if you think about what you're actually doing, you might try, you, you probably uh, can understand why this happened. But in Sweden, purely coupling the approach developed for the Netherlands didn't work. At least the accuracy was 0.7, so 70%. But that, that wasn't uh, high uh, according to our standards. But there is clearly a signal in that data indicative of, of being innovative, but you couldn't apply it in the same way as in the Netherlands. Uh, so we need to realize that because I'm very positive about what you can do with it, because you can uh, estimate the number of innovative companies, small innovative companies, without sending them a survey, without annoying them, and, and you still have an idea how things are doing, and you can produce very detailed, uh, obtain very detailed data at the municipality level. And there's a huge interest in the Netherlands also to see if, if, if stimulating innovation or stimulating startups uh, uh, by certain measures, if, 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 you, if you're able to uh, use this method to test if that really helps or not. But we still need to be aware of the fact that we're not directly measuring innovation, we are measuring the association between the presence of certain combination of words and the specification of innovative and non-innovative companies used in Europe. And, and clearly, uh, this relation can also be used to detect small innovative companies in the Netherlands. But this relation uh, is essentially uh, uh, depends on how a website is used by a company. And clearly, the behavior of companies in the Netherlands, the upper part of Belgium and in Germany, uh, shows that this can be done. Uh, apparently, how a website is used by an innovative company and how the words shown on the websites are used is something that you can capture with this model and that you can use. But apparently, this, this, the results for Sweden indicate that it's not always the same for each country. It might be that in Sweden, websites are used in a very different way than, than, than what we are doing. And that's an important point here. We have to realize that we're not directly measuring the thing that we want to do. And, and, and here, it's nice to quote Mar, uh, which was uh, uh, included in the presentation of, of, uh, of Marco, try to understand the nature of the problem being solved, what you're actually doing here. And, and if you're so focused on analyzing data and scraping websites, classify models, you sometimes forget the why question. So, uh, but it, it, it shows you that if you're very careful, you can start in a deductive way and do all kinds of checks and, and eventually end up in a deductive way of working and you're still uh, able to, uh, uh, to use all, all the, the, and the experience you have to develop a model that has a very interesting promises for the use in official statistics. But there are more, and, and uh, I will talk about some uh, other examples now. Uh, one of the examples that I'd like to show you, the second example is, is an approach very similar to uh, uh, what I just told you about. It's again, using the text of websites because this was a question that was actually asked uh, to me uh, in the beginning of the COVID period, uh, Pete, based on the experience you have with detecting innovative companies, could you develop something similar to detect platform economy websites? And, and uh, I thought that's great. Let's let's try and test it. And just for the sake of argument, uh, uh, it's important to know what is exactly a platform economy website. In principle, it stated that a platform economy website is an online platform that mediates uh, or, or supports the exchange of goods, services, or information between individuals, companies, and others. Examples, Airbnb is a great example. People uh, have, a, have a room to spare, and they want to rent it to other people, and there are other people that would like to rent it people. Airbnb supports that. That's a platform economy. And in principle, the department responsible for that wants to identify as much platform economy companies as possible by looking at their website, and then from that information, determine the turnover. So what we're looking at is, can we use the text on the web pages to detect platform economy websites just to pre-screen the population of Dutch companies and identify the companies that have a high potential of being a platform economy website? If that's the case, 
those will uh, be sent a questionnaire that they need to fill in. So this is at the beginning of the statistical process. Um, we did that. They provided a set of examples of platform economy websites, and actually they found 680 positive examples. And this is usually what happens in our office. Somebody wants you to build a classifier, and they give you positive examples only, and, and uh, it is a bit strange. Fortunately, in this case, uh, a few negative examples were given uh, because they said, yeah, we tried to do some selection. And, and they said we have, yeah, the majority of them were platform economy uh, websites. Some of them really resembled them, but they weren't platform economy websites. And that's great if you try to develop a model because in principle, you mean you have examples that are really clear examples and are positive examples of platform economy. And if you really resemble them, but are not, and then I just added a random sample of non-platform economy websites from the business registry. Just draw a random sample of uh, from the business register, look at those websites, make sure there's not accidentally a platform economy one in there. And I, I ended up with a 50% positive and 50% negative uh, uh, ratio, just to check if it's if if there is a difference between those websites and if it's in the same ratio at least uh, uh, there's a random chance of classifying something positive or negative. So any higher than 50% means there is some signal in there that you could use. Uh, so we developed the model, tried some standard pre-processing. Uh, we found out here that we need to combine the information on multiple web pages per website. So we scraped a lot. And in the end, we ended up with a support factor machine with an accuracy of 82%. That was the best option available. It's not perfect. I always try to aim for a higher, but, but if you're pre-screening it, uh, using it for a pre-screen method, then I thought, okay, this is the maximum we can get out, out of this approach. And uh, uh, that should be okay. We tested it. The model provided the chance of being a platform economy website. It was a small test set, but it showed some U-shaped distribution, so it could be okay. You need large amounts. You could preferably you need to classify large amounts. And I will show you a distribution later on. And there are obvious words positively associated with platform economy. Uh, uh, register, com, again, com from commercial company, login, platform. That's nice if the word platform is in the top 10. Invest, sign up. So it means a website where you need to become a member or, or something like that. So you need to register at least. So that makes sense. And the negatives are a lot of other types of websites. So I'm not going to show you here because they're, they're a mixture, but the positive words uh, seem to point into the right direction. So that's, uh, that's very nice. Then we apply that model to every website we have scraped uh, uh, that was linked to companies on the, in the, included in the business register. And then something very strange popped up. If you have around 850 websites, and this is the probability of being a, a uh, a platform economy website, there's a huge peak uh, close to zero and a very, very small amount on the, on the right side, which is the chance of being a, a, a platform economy website. So it's really skewed that the majority of the companies are obviously non-platform economy website. It's not the same distribution that was seen by the innovative company stuff. And if you zoom in on this small part, then you can see there is a small peak there. And very close to a uh, value of zero, actually be, uh, around 9.5. So, so, so up, up to zero, 9.5, you can see that, that the value starts to increase there, which suggests there's some subgroup there that might be indicative of a platform economy website. And we're suffering from the effect that uh, uh, Marco showed you earlier. We've developed a model on 50% platform economy and 50% non-platform economy. But you had no clue how this ratio was uh, in, 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 the actual, in the actual world, in the real world. And, and it's clear that platform economy websites are not the majority of, uh, <laughs> it's the other way around. There's only a small part of all companies in our business register are platform economy websites. And we actually also applied the model developer market to, uh, uh, to compensate for that, which means we end up with a smaller amount of uh, uh, of companies that had a high chance of being a platform economy website, but they still included some false positives. But that, that's not the problem. It's great to use it as a pre-screening method. So uh, we found that uh, 
quite a large number at a, our potential platform economy if you assume the cutoff value of 0.5, but you shouldn't do that. That's what uh, Marco taught you in the early presentation. And we did a lot of manual checking. Uh, websites with a, P, uh, with a value of above 0.8 were found to be uh, more interesting. They also claim, contain some adult sites and, and some sites with, with uh, uh, not a lot of text. They were uh, removed because we want, want to make sure that we focus on the correct websites in this case. In the end, we ended up with uh, 5,700 websites, uh, which were linked to uh, a bit more than 4,000 companies. And by carefully looking at them, the experts decided to go the 3,522 companies are really interesting. They all received a survey. Uh, the response was fairly okay for the current standard. So uh, more than 2,000 companies responded of which 537 were really identified as platform economy websites. And the interesting thing here is you have a machine learning based pre-screening that you do. You send them a survey and receive from this, those companies information that you can use to identify them as a platform economy website and you can combine it with the chances that you had obtained. Yeah, and based on this, it was found that platform economy companies all had a websites with a value above 0.95 equal to or a value higher than 0.95. So this really demonstrates that this text-based approach is a very uh, good way to, uh, to pre-screen it. And we actually applied this model this year again, and, and we can confirm that the model is stable and it is reused now to again pre-select uh, platform economy websites and send them a survey. Uh, this work was done by uh, by an intern that, that really did great work. And I was really happy with this finding because finally we had another data source that we could use to confirm our text-based machine learning uh, approach. So that's nice. This, this is one example. Uh, but there is a big data source that a lot of uh, uh, people already know, but, but they might not think about uh, that being a big data source, and, and that's scanner data. And, and, and in a lot of countries, they increasingly use scanner data to uh, obtain prices for products that are used to create the consumer price index. And in the Netherlands, all data is obtained from secondary data sources. So we don't use surveys anymore. There are no people going to shops and writing down prices. Everything is used from either scanner data or obtained via web scraping. Uh, scanner data is a, is a is a data set obtained in the beginning from supermarkets. So every week at the end of the week, supermarkets sent us aggregated data that contained information on the number of products sold, their codes, and the price of the product. So how many bananas were sold in the Netherlands and how many things. And that's used uh, for uh, uh, the consumer price index. But we can, uh, but because uh, you receive such data sources every week, um, you can do all, uh, all types of analysis and you can use such a data source also for new types of analysis. For instance, to gain quick insights and especially during COVID, it was interesting to see what kind of products are being sold certainly in the beginning of, of COVID where we had essentially had a lockdown. What are the products uh, uh, sold? the most at that point in time. Uh, usually it's bananas in the Netherlands in supermarkets, but something changed. So uh, there was uh, what we call hoarding happening during the pandemic. And, and these analysis, they were also published on our website. And it was clear from this data that there was a run on rice, which you can store a lot, it's food, and you can store it a lot, hand soap, obviously, and toilet paper. But the same thing happened in Germany, if I recall well an anecdote of, of Marco about hoarding toilet paper in Germany. And this is just an example to show because we have a regularly delivery of these kinds of data sources, you're able to do all sorts of additional uh, uh, one-off uh, analysis see, uh, to get more insight on what's going on in society. And, and this is a very interesting one that's been published uh, during the corona uh, pandemic. A uh, big data source that's obviously should be mentioned and, uh, and I've talked a lot about it together with Marco on, on the work with, that we did in the beginning of our big data period is, is road sensor data. And, and road sensors in the Netherlands are essential um, either loops or cameras uh, that count the number of vehicles passing at certain locations in the Netherlands. And this was a great data source to start working on big data in our office 
because it's a huge amount of data. At that point in time, there were 20,000 sensors on the Dutch highways alone. So that excludes all the smaller roads. Those are the highways. And they're very different type of sensors, but all the data is available for every minute of the day, 24 seven, uh, 24 hours and, and seven days a week. Uh, and this is the Netherlands and the highways and essentially all the roads are covered. If you create a plot of that, you can see that a lot of those roads are fully covered with sensors. So we have a huge number of sensors. Well, there are some roads that have less sensors and there was even a road that are, had sensors, but apparently was not included in the original map we showed here. Uh, and it's data that's quite noisy as well. It contains errors and there are mistakes in there. And sometimes the sensor doesn't work. So it produces all the kinds of interesting profiles in which you can see in principle. If you look carefully, you can see the whole week, you can see the working days, the five days where you have a morning and an evening rush hour peak. I, think I can indicate that here. And in the weekend, the behavior is very different. And you can see a single sensor might occasionally fail, but there's always another sensor in, in, in a few kilometers lying ahead where you can use the data from as well. And it's also clear that the data can be very noisy, can be very erroneous, but sometimes looks really, uh, really well. And we use the data to create a traffic index in the Netherlands. And, and I'm showing you the first part of this series uh, because it really shows that when the new year starts, there's a real dip in the number of vehicles on the Dutch highways, that's because everybody's at home, they're enjoying the holiday. But this plot also nicely shows that in the beginning of this series, uh, uh, the data looks, uh, looks a bit odd. And that's because the roads were not really well covered with road sensors then. So we didn't have a lot of sensors on the road. And this also indicates that if you have more sensors, the data becomes better and better. And this is a very nice plot and I have very nice memories on the work we did here. A fifth example of use of big data and official statistics, and I'm very proud to tell you this because we're actually going to produce an official social media based uh, statistic uh, very soon and not an experimental one, but an official one is the uh, use of social media. This is usually the, the, the most difficult big data source you can imagine because social media, it, it's interesting, but there's only a small part of the population active on it. And that probably is a selective part of the population. And you can only use publicly available messages. It's a, a lot of work to collect it, but fortunately there are commercial companies that do that. And in the Netherlands, we closely cooperate with a company that collects all the data. So in principle, certainly for Twitter, we have all uh, publicly available messages in the Netherlands and for some other platforms, we have a large part of those messages. We did a number of studies. Uh, we had some great findings. The best findings we had was the general social sentiment indicator that we developed and clearly correlated with uh, uh, consumer confidence, but I'm not gonna tell you about it. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give you some short examples of the social tension indicator and the social tension indicator is going to be published in uh, uh, fairly soon. And some examples of some COVID studies that you can do with social media, just to give you an idea of the possibilities you have with these kind of data sources. Uh, social tension indicator is uh, started as an example of something that we wanted to measure. We, in principle, we wanted to measure uh, the safety feelings of safety, we have a survey on that. Uh, and we, we had the idea, could we use social media to detect safety feelings online or feelings of unsafety online? And if it's nearly real time available, it's also something you can experiment with a real time indicator or a daily indicator. And, and that you could apply that to Twitter as well, because it's obvious that on Twitter, people are really want to be the first to report some interesting news. So if that news is related to feelings of safety or unsafety in our country, can we use that? So we uh, developed, uh, we started in a very traditional way. Uh, we interviewed people and, and, and asked them questions on the types of words they use to express feelings of safety or unsafety. So we end up in the end with a list of around 350 words associated with safety and unsafety. And then we start looking up in the database we have access to from the company called Cousteau, uh, how often these words occur. And we found out that only 150 of those words are used frequently online, which is an indication 
that the vocabulary on social media is much uh, poorer than on the, in real life. Uh, that's my impression as well. Um, but that means those 150 words could be used to count the number of messages containing those words and the sentiment of those words could be used to determine if they feel safe or unsafe. And we also found out that because we essentially use the same language as the people in the upper part of Belgium, Flanders, that we need to remove those, best, uh, those people as well. So you have a have sort of a mixed population here. And we try to reduce the number of messages from outside of the Netherlands as much as possible, because we want to measure the situation in the Netherlands. And then a very interesting profile occurred, but we thought, and there were peaks in there. Uh, uh, are we measuring? What are we actually measuring here? Are we measuring feeling of sun, of safety or unsafety? And, and we looked at the peaks, and we found out that peaks occurred uh, when. Yes. There were, yes. Quick okay. interruption, just to say ah. you have another five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll round it off as quickly as possible. So we we uh, what essentially did is that we started with the idea of measuring safety or unsafety, but because we only had a limited number of words that were used, we checked. What those peaks actually represent and, and we found out that they're not measuring safety but they're measuring social unrest people are sending out messages that something is wrong in society and it, eventually we, we, we called it the social uh, uh, tension indicator it was tested for a year together with the police and the ministry of justice and and we thought it was okay, and, and the interesting thing is if you have peaks, you can click on them and you can see the topics and the words used by those people, and it gives you an indication of the, the, the event that they're reacting upon. Uh, and then after a year, we decided, okay, the project ends, and now we stop. But at the moment that we pulled the plug out of this indicator, the, the police and the Ministry of Justice start calling us, yeah, we really need the social tension indicator because it's an important indicator uh, used by uh, by to report to the Dutch government. So we're now making sure that it becomes an official statistics and it's something completely new to compare what we uh, have already done. Uh, we, you can also do stuff on COVID. Uh, we developed an indicator that's able to detect the sentiment on COVID. And Marco has done very interesting uh, work on if it, you're able to detect people with COVID symptoms on social media. And if that increases, that's an indication of, uh, uh, in this case, the second corona peak. So you're able to nearly real time measure the spread or, or the people that are, are infected by COVID by using very advanced modeling stuff. For the people that have access to this presentation, this is a list of all big data uh, uses for official statistics, at least in Europe. It would be great if you have other examples uh, uh, to include them here as well, because I'm trying to get an overview of all possible applications of big data for official statistics. The first two are in production, the third will become in production, and the rest is all in the implementation or experimental phase. So thank you for your attention. Big data is a very interesting potential application for official statistics. And I will stop thank here. Because otherwise I'll stop talking. <laughs> no, that that was excellent. And apologies, you still had another two, two or three minutes. But yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You you can cover up during the questions. Um, I will now read one question we have on the chat. Um, maybe um, um, one from Anna Gabriela Faria. Great presentation. How did you represent the tokens? I think she was she asked this during your presentation on the um, on the identification of innovative companies. Mm -hmm. And did you use word embeddings or a sparse matrix? That's probably yeah, yeah, a very yeah. technical yeah. one, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try to explain it uh, as simple as possible. In in principle, I, I didn't mention that we use word embeddings, but in principle. Uh, you start uh, with the text from the web pages and you know if that text is, corresponds to an uh, innovative or non-innovative company. Um, and then you, uh, you, you look in principle at the occurrence of the words. Uh, I use a uh, TF-IDF uh, approach there. But we found out that that didn't contain all the information you want. And you can use word embeddings if you look at, uh, at text to extract extra information. In principle, that's the combination of words, how often combination of words occur in, on a website. 
and that really uh, geared up our accuracy. So it's it's part of, of our model is a, it is trained on the combination of uh, term frequencies, that's the TF IDF, and the word embeddings as well. And, and that's used to develop a model. And the interesting thing is that points to a difference between Sweden and Flanders and the Netherlands. The word embeddings model for Flanders developed by the student was different than the one for the Netherlands. And that's something we didn't change uh, for Sweden. And, and probably uh, uh, the word embeddings is an essential part of the model. And it might there might be a need to develop a specific word embeddings part for each country, because the way words are used or in combination might be different for different countries. So it's a great, a great question. Yeah. Thank you. I have another one. Um, congratulations. Uh, this is from Jose Antonio. Thank you to sharing uh, these interesting examples. In the first example, you mentioned the risk of indirect measurement. But does the model somehow consider the possibility of false innovative image on the pages fueled by the search result itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, a challenging question because I'm, I'm trying to interpret what, what that person actually means. But what it it what it does is is by at least you, you can correct for the fact there are some false positive, false negatives in there. And, and, and that's something that you can capture because in principle, you want to estimate the number of innovative companies. We tend to, to, to look at this and, and say, no, every website should be correctly classified. But in principle, the goal of a statistical office is to get an estimate of the number of companies. And that doesn't mean that everything has to be exactly correct. But overall, uh, the number should be okay. Thank you. I, I hope that answers the question. Otherwise, just just contact me again to uh, okay to explain um, what you actually want. We have one from Amar Marine. In your experience of big data and ML, mm -hmm. do you start with the finer criteria for the research question as the traditional methodology? I'm not sure I, I get the full meaning. Mm -hmm. Maybe Amar could uh, get online and, no, and present the, the question. The, the, the yes. Uh, hello, hello. Congratulations. Hello. Um, so by by coincidence, I'm the editor in chief of International Journal of Medical Informatics as well, and I received several articles from Netherlands, and I know several people from there. And one uh, big issue with the eyes on the healthcare, you know, I know you have a very nice data set. It's called NICE in Netherlands that collects all ICU, intensive care unit and all COVID. But uh, finer criteria, it's um, when we start a traditional uh, research in healthcare, and uh, it stands for, it's feasible, the data we have, it's interesting, it's novel, we'll bring some new knowledge, it's ethical to use mm -hmm. all those data, and it's relevant to create uh, um, some outcomes for the uh, human being. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there is a lot of machine learning methods and uh, papers in healthcare. They don't explain the results. So how reliable uh, it's to adopt an automated uh, prognostic, for instance, yeah. in uh, COVID, in uh, ICU. And we are using a lot of uh, big data and machine learning. But mm -hmm. in your experience, uh, how can you rely on those models? Yeah, that's Thank a great you. question. Yeah. The, 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 Thank you. In principle, a lot of the, the, the answers are already indicated in, in Marcus' presentation. You have to look very carefully at the model, but I, I can give you a great example. That's something I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, we developed the model just to test the idea to, to see if there's a relation between the text on a web page and the fact that the company is innovative. 
and then we uh, uh, I mentioned that we moved some words and and the interesting uh, thing there is that we discovered that we were somehow picking up a, a link uh, an association with innovative companies with the month of July and non-innovative with the month of August and we scraped the web pages during the uh, period of July and August so apparently we scraped more innovative companies in July than we did in August and that's not something that you want to picked up by the model. So you're, you're constantly checking what the model is doing and, and see if it makes sense. That's why you're, you're testing stuff. That's why you're looking at the words with the, with the most positive uh, weights and, and the words with the lowest weights, just to make sure that it makes sense what you're doing. And, and that's something that you should always do. And, and it's in the nature of a lot of scientists. But if you want to have quick results, you can just apply a model and say, OK, this is it. Then the real science start. That's something people forget, and 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 that's what Marco also wanted to point out in his presentation. So that's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Piet. Mm -hmm. I don't see other questions in our chat box. Uh, you may have one more minute if you wish to send in your yeah. question. Yeah, the, the, the previous question that you asked me that we both didn't really understand, Marco made a remark on that. And, and that has to do with the fact that at the moment that you, again, uh, relation between text and innovative companies, the, 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 over time, you could expect that the wordings used on the websites might change. Uh, innovation starts, uh, 3D printing might be a great hype now, but it isn't over uh, in a number of years, it might be something else. So your you have your models should be able to deal with the dynamics in the world, the, the the way people use a website or the people the way people use social media might change, and you should always check if the original assumptions you made in the beginning and 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 the original data set on which you developed data if if the model is still applicable on the current situation. This this is something that you call concept drift. Are you measuring the same concept, or is it drifting away? And that's uh, something that we, we, we work on as well to make sure that we are still measuring what we think we are measuring. And that, that's an important okay. point. Yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any new questions. So this is time for us to bring the session to a close. I won't do that. I'll hand it over to Alexandri for that role. But thank you uh, to you and Marco again for excellent, inspiring presentations. Uh, congratulations on this um, um, huge amount of work you guys are doing in the Netherlands on this topic. We are all um, uh, eager to learn more from you uh, over the coming months and, and, and years. And um, well done, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand over to Alexandre now for the closing of the event today. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pedro. Thank you for your excellent moderation. And um, I, a big thank to our speakers, Marco and Pete, uh, for the excellent and inspiring presentation. Uh, you gave uh, really very good examples and applications. And I, I, I'm sure that uh, it was a huge contribution to the, the data community not only in Brazil, but in Latin America and abroad as well. Um, you know that the, the main objective of this uh, uh, workshop, series of workshop, is to put together data producers and data users so that we can uh, really create a new um, ecosystem. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that we are building a new data ecosystem with new data sources uh, new methods for data collection and data processing and modeling, as uh, both of you have explained it. So the future of data production is a mixture of different methods and data sources. So thank you really very, very much. I hope that uh, uh, you will remain our contact for uh, next year edition. Um, and I would like to invite all of you to come back tomorrow for our last day webinar. Uh, tomorrow we will have um, a session on international projects on AI. We are going to have speakers from OSCD, uh, from UNESCO, from the International Research Center on AI, IRCAI, which is a Slovenian center 
um, which is a UNESCO category two center, just like CETIC, we are broader um, type of uh, centers, and also representants from the Center for the Fourth Industrial Re Revo uh, Revolution. So these international organizations will share with us tomorrow, will showcase their initiatives and their projects on AI. And of course, the importance of measurement, of having proper indicators and statistics to measure the adoption of these uh, technologies. And of course, to measure the impacts in society, in business industries and governments. So. Uh, please do come back tomorrow at the same time. You can use the same link for our last day of this year edition of the NIC.br annual workshop on survey methodologies. Thank you very much. Wishing you a good afternoon in Europe and good morning uh, here in, south, uh, in the global south. Thank you very much.